Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Bruce Broussard. You're on. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Oregon Voters Digest. No, I'm not Bruce Broussard. Bruce Broussard will be back next Sunday. However, I'm Eugene Rashad, and it's a pleasure to be talking to you once again. Um, the community was shook by the death of Rob Ingram, uh, Rob Ingram community leader, uh, community champion, uh, died at the age of 38. And I must say, it's, it, it was a real shock to most of us that he had passed away. Um, uh, I'm not a numer numerologist, but uh, I thought about the number 38, and I said, well, three is the number of completion, beginning, middle, and end. And then I thought, uh, on the seventh day, the Creator took a rest. So I added one, and I come up with the number 38, and I says, wow, well, what a, what a, what a fitting closure to the life of a wonderful community champion. Uh, Rob Ingram and condolences go out to his family as well. Again, I'm Eugene Rashad, a guest host for Oregon Voters Digest. We have a tremendous show for you uh, this afternoon. I've got two community champions to my right, and uh, they're friends, and they're just tremendous people. Uh, you talk about having, uh, is there a doctor in the house? Well, there certainly is a couple of doctors in the house, and I have to my right uh, Dr. Hardy, and to his right, Dr. Mason. And what we're here to talk about in the first half hour is the built environment and our health. Um, in the second half hour, we'll talk about economic development. So I hope that you have uh, the opportunity to listen and to tune in and to uh, consider some of the information that we'll, sh we'll share with you in the hopes that we can improve health and certainly uh, raise questions about what are the, ter what are the deterrents, uh, the obstacles uh, to better health outcomes. So I want to start with... Uh, Pastor Hardy. Dr. Hardy has been on a sojourn on a trip to uh, Atlanta, Georgia for the last uh, few days. Why don't you tell us about that trip, Dr. Hardy? Um, thank you, Eugene. First of all, let me say it is an honor and a privilege to be here on the show that you're holding, and it's a wonderful thing that you're doing to keep the community aware and informed on issues critical to creating healthy communities. Um, I'm just returning from Atlanta where I was um, working with the Center for Disease Control, CDC, you know, on behalf of the Capacity Building Institute. And the objective is to take these communities and empower them to develop capacity to address issues about healthy lifestyles, yes. healthy living. Number one, to be able to take a look at place settings and to do assessments to find out how healthy are those communities and, and what health activities are available to the community. What access do they have for walking and biking and to be able to commute in safe spaces. Then what do they have as far as eating habits, um, as far as marketing, tobacco use, taking a look at water consumption and consumption of sweetened beverages. So. Um, helping communities address those issues in their, you know, uh, that, that help create healthy lifestyles. I know uh, this is a, a national movement for our, our audience. We want to try and uh, define, Dr. Mason, the term built environment because uh, we say community, but in, in, in health speak, uh, built environment talks about all of the, the, the resources uh, necessary to have uh, in a community. Some people call it the, three, uh, the 15 or 20 minute neighborhood. But in the built environment, it's where you live, work, pray, shop, and study. And uh, oftentimes, uh, people don't really associate the built environment as a risk factor to health. Doc, so, Dr. Mason, can you kind of give us a, a definition, a working definition of the built environment and why people should be a, a bit more concerned about what it offers? Well, uh, very similar to what uh, Dr. Hardy was suggesting is that there are numerous structures that exist in any community that can sustain health or actually deter it. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, where people might walk or where people might exercise. I mean, there's such things as bike lanes, such things as parks. One of the things I'm really encouraged by is um, 
uh, watching the role that you and your church play as part of the built environment. Um, one of the interesting things, an interesting twist on the built environment is how it has changed significantly over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. I could think of, for example, uh, personally growing up and going to parks, and parks were safe places. There was, uh, there was supervision. Um, so as a parent, uh, my folks would s send me to the park to play because they knew that there was Mr. So-and-so there watching kids and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, as we've lost a lot of urban funding, what you find is that the parks are no longer a safe part of the environment. I'm not saying they're dangerous, and I think we have a very good park system here in Portland, but what you don't find is the adult supervision. You might find gangs, for example, at a park, right? So as a parent, you might not send your kid there. You might send him in the backyard to keep him at home to keep him safe. So in many ways, the built environment is critical. You also allude to the fact of what types of temptations might exist in a built environment. So you, you mentioned marketing, and we've had this discussion numerous times, but in certain communities you find more tobacco, more mm -hmm. sweetened beverages, uh, market, more fast food, mm -hmm. right? fewer broccoli, fewer apples. Um, and then there's a, a strange twist, and, and, and I think the CDC is dealing with this to some extent when you're talking about building capacity. When you're planning communities, who's at the planning table? Right. So I, I'm not dissing anything or anyone, but if you think of an activity that a community might not gauge in, you might not put a hockey rink in the hood, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or you might not put a squash court in the, in, 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 in the res or the, or the body. Um, I'm not saying that certain That's people right. can't do that. They don't do that typically, right? Or, or a bike lane, for example, without teaching a community how to partake of this part of the built environment. So when we think of the built environment, a simple way of thinking about it are the structures, perhaps, the physical resources that exist um, that can be conducive to health or not. And, and as you were suggesting also, uh, Dr. Hardy, um, finding healthy food in, in many poor working class communities is a challenge. Mm -hmm. we, and we want to we uh, press, press that just a little further so we talk about where people live, work, pray, play, and worship. And uh, Pastor Hardy talked about assessments and the important role of assessments and how after you get those assessments completed, looking at ways to fill those gaps. And I know at, at Highland, you've done, undergone some kind of process of assessments. Can you talk about that and, and what were the outcomes? Yeah, uh, part of assessments, especially at Highland, it, it, it involved me becoming educated mm -hmm. as the spiritual leader of that house, <coughs> excuse me, and the attempt of, of addressing spiritual issues, a lot of it stems from just natural conditions. Um, when people are coming in there asking their clergy and persons of faith to pray for cancer, to pray that God will help regulate the blood pressure and God will help with hypertension um, or mm -hmm. diabetes. Well, we know God can work miracles. We believe that. But some things, we don't need a miracle if we could just implement prevention. So I had to educate myself. And that's where I met Dr. Mason, and he's just a wealth of resource. He was a man that's inspirational. He understands church environment. He understood the gap between what I do know and what I didn't know, and he was able to fill in those gaps and help. And through partnerships with things like he would show and the, the initiatives he was working with at the time, he was working with the state, mm -hmm. and um, just encouraging me to continue that. Instead of pushing back the church and saying, well, the church isn't involved, this is a state issue, he understood the collaboration. So with getting knowledge and becoming armed, and then I begin to inform my congregants about the issues uh, pertaining to healthy lifestyles. And we can teach about the spiritual aspects, but we need to do the things that are right for the body. And then partnering with Multnomah County, um, we begin to find out ways of how to improve in improve our uh, space and putting in bike racks and then when I ride my bike to mm -hmm. church on a Sunday <laughs> and uh, people are like whoa here comes the pastor it was a total different mindset and then here comes the pastor in his you know Acura or you know the, the, the motor vehicle it all of a sudden starts to catch on and become contagious to see pastor drinking water and then to see we're advocating for drinking water and then advocating for fruit uh, alternatives because people hate to just do cold turkey yeah. and um, so alternative healthy alternatives was how we introduced it and then we always have the alternatives and then if you see your role models uh, partaking of healthy foods then you just feel like well you know just peer pressure and uh, so uh, those were things that we implemented there and then we began <coughs> to share that with fellow clergy and <laughs> imams and what yes. was important is that it's a faith movement 
not a denominational movement. It cuts across all sorts of uh, barriers and, and uh, um, different uh, boundaries and that we put up ourselves of, of denominations and theological revelations. It's just the basics, healthy body, yes. healthy life, healthy spirit. I want to I want to unpack that that whole uh, ideal of, of uh, what you eat becomes a part of you a bit, Dr. Mason, and what are some of the barriers as to why people can't seem to have uh, regular access to healthy food. Food culture plays a big role in determining health outcomes, good or bad, and I know that the uh, fast food industry has created these in tremendous. Uh, marketing strategies to keep people buying their foods. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the existence of fast foods in the built environment and why people should take a second look? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that um, <laughs> if you look at the, the fast food outlets, they, they've well researched the communities they serve. They know, for example, that uh, in, in certain poor communities in particular, you find a disproportionate number of homes that are single uh, female-headed households, right? And many of the moms are working, right? They get home, They've had a hard day, and they've got three screaming kids, and sometimes it's easier just to run around the corner to a to a fast food outlet than to, than to spend the hour and a half that it might take to prepare a decent <coughs> meal. We have to kind of get back to that. Um, I think one of the interesting things, as we moved from the south and became more urban, our lifestyle became much more sedentary as we moved mm -hmm. up the, the, the economic food chain, right? We also lived higher on the hog. We began to eat more meat and also began to partake in the economy of, of, of marketing. So a lot of those things that were targeted at us, we, we, we weren't very critical consumers. And as mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Harding is suggesting is, um, we as, as leaders are in, are in better positions have to <coughs> recognize that we are absolutely role models and drink the water, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, and uh, be seen at the parks, exercising, um, making sure that we're passing it on to our young people. And I, I don't make a much of a distinction between the physical body and the spiritual <laughs> body. Right. I mean, they kind of go good. hand in hand. It's hard to do one without the other, believe it or not. So the thing I think is innovative is seeing a faith-based institution is playing a significant role. I mean that writ large, the, the mosque, the, the, the synagogues, the temples, the sweat lodges, so forth. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, making sure that uh, we are, are, are creating future leaders. Because I think another big part of how the built environment gets built is who's at the table when we're designing the built environment. Right, and so that's a critical part. So, uh, seeing the, the 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 stuff that you're reading and what you're working on now, the idea is how do we crank out more people that will articulate like ourselves, that will come to a public meeting, who will say that no, my kids will play this way, but they won't play this way, who might say, uh, can you zone differently so that we don't end up with so many, uh, and I'm not knocking anything, food carts, fast food outlets, and not any green grocers, not any fresh vegetables, things of that nature, and then to some extent we probably need to be somewhat critical of the media and wonder can they uh, put some of uh, our kids and kids that our kids would aspire to be eating the apples, drinking the water. That's right. Um, the NFL is doing a good job. I think 60 minute exercises a day. Uh, we have to find the same type of uh, 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 motivation or vehicles occurring at the community level. And when I see uh, uh, facilities and churches like Highland, that gives me hope. We're, we're talking about uh, <coughs> physical activity. We're talking about nutrition. And we're talking about ways to move vulnerable populations further upstream. And that seems to be a big challenge when you look at how the fast food industry continues to put their product out there. And the income does shape people's decisions when it comes to eating. Why should they go to uh, New Seasons or Whole Foods to buy a Fuji apple for $1.50 when they can go to McDonald's and almost get a full meal? So that, that continues to be an ongoing problem. Is there are ways that well, we can address the, the, that. The health education thing is, is important. I mean, uh, uh, that, that's, and, and, and strangely enough, again, we turn the clock back, we would find that this health information was passed on intergenerationally. I'm sure you grew up with your parents talking about fiber or roughage, mm -hmm. um, eating those vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, we seem to lost that. I think uh, uh, our parents' voice is being muted somehow by marketing voices, right? So we have to make sure that we're creating this message. I mean, uh, it's, and here's the other thing. It's not just an, uh, an ethnic issue or a community issue. It's a societal issue. It's in society's best interest to keep as many people healthy as you possibly can, to hold down the cost of health care and things of that nature. So I think there's enough work to go around. And, and, and like I said, a big part that we play is trying to uh, inspire people to take uh, leadership, mm -hmm. um, to articulate, um, 
and it doesn't require a PhD or, 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 or any other type of a, a seminary degree, anything else to, to step up and be a leader. We've seen leaders come from, uh, uh, from elders, from people who don't have a lot of formal education, but who take the community very much to heart. So I think some of our old messages have been lost over the last 15, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. I, I, knew, I knew for a fact when uh, Bruce asked me to guest host this program and, and with the two of you agreeing to come down and talk a little bit that we'll be able to take this discussion out of the academics, out of the intellectual, and put it right on the ground, the population level where people could actually understand the importance of personal responsibility in making choices about nutrition and becoming more physically active. But there's another element that certainly plays into this whole scenario, and that's racism. Now, institutionalized racism plays a big role. For example, it's not so much that it's uh, um, um, uh, so overt, but it's generational. Uh, it's in the employment industry. It's in the education industry. It's in the entertainment industry. And uh, people who are under duress, like racism can cause people to be under, uh, there's a tendency to eat more because cortisol is active and the endorphins are not turned on. Either of you want to jump on that? You know, the interesting uh, book that I just got through is uh, by uh, Augustus White out of Harvard. And it's entitled Seeing Patients. And it talks about the unconscious or unwitting bias on the part of many health systems and many health practitioners. So a, a strange thing happens. If you come in my facility and you smell like smoke, I might look down my nose at you. If you're a little bit too obese, I might, and I might talk about personal responsibility. I might forsake the whole idea about how you've been marketed to or anything like that. So I, I believe in personal responsibility uh, to, to an extent. But I think, uh, again, I'll go back to the thing I said earlier. Um, all of us need to become health advocates. All of us need to step up and play a role. And we can uh, uh, talk to our own grocers about perhaps putting those tobacco products just a little bit not so visible. Can we take that candy out of the checkout lane so you don't have the two or three year old screaming to, to get at it? I mean, we have to take uh, become leaders in our own right. And like I said, uh, as I've worked uh, across this country, what I found is that you can't predict leaders as a, as a basis of their degree or their income. Mm -hmm. We find them everywhere. And so when I see programs talking about communities transforming, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about how do we get more voices mm -hmm. beside us. And then who your voice may resonate will, will, will vary. Some of us are going to be very credible with younger folks. Some of us may be credible with City Hall, right? Some of us may be credible with marketing or uh, other distributors. So there's roles for all of us. And ultimately what I would say is not just a black, brown, poor issue. It's in the community at large best interest to uh, 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 play a, a role in this. And again, we need to create more safe environments. So uh, you mentioned from the context of elders, but that our kids can play safely and not go to a place to play and come home high, or not go to a place to play and come home knowing how to engage in some other uh, uh, negative behavior. So I think the idea of, of bias or racism is, is operant. In many cases, as you see, it's not so overt. And once it becomes in institutionalized, it doesn't need a convener. It doesn't need mm -hmm. someone to, right. to, to, to drive it. It drives itself. So all of us need to begin to wonder about mm -hmm. uh, 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 health outcomes and how that might impact uh, our, our national budget, our regional budgets, our, our health care facilities and things of that nature. Um, so no, I, I think that there has to be to some degree a wedding between uh, faith, uh, the public sector and the private sector. Um, and like I said, there's so much talent and so many un un untapped resources in the community that can be very easily cultivated and become leaders uh, 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 with their own niches. That's cool. That's and I like what he said about personal accountability yes. because I think here in America, um, ever since the slavery, the black community has never had an identity. And so they're constantly grappling with who am I? Mm -hmm. There's the personal self-hatred, uh, they emulate another race. Uh, you can go, you used to could, and when I grew up, you went into a black home and you might see um, Asian art, you might see Western art, uh, you know, you might have cowboy hat and some boots, you might have, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Asian, you know, uh, rice paper type partitions there and some artwork, but African, black, we were struggling to find out who we are. Because of that niche in the community of not knowing who they are, anytime a voice was raised that spoke about consciousness, black consciousness, uh, I mean, you, you know, you raise your hand and say black power and, you, you know, you boycott it out of the Olympics, you know. Um, you stand up and you say, hey, we are our people. You don't have to take this. You get assassinated. So there's been that void. So the media fill that void. They tell us who we're supposed to be. They advertise to that niche and they try to say, 
here's what successful black people do. They get a Budweiser. They get some yeah, cigarettes. Lifestyle. They commercial. dress like this. And so we've got this generation constantly grappling for who are we? Who are we? We have people right now that define us by Barack Obama. So the, the, the assumption is because you have a black Democratic president, all the black people have arrived. Well, what about the black Republican? Or what about the black, you know, independent? Uh, independent? So even Barack does not define what the black is in America. <laughs> And just because he made it to the White House, there's still somebody struggling That's right. out here in the other house. So that, that is no indicator that we have arrived. So because of those niches, the, the media comes in and tells us what uh, success looks like and those types of things. And that, therefore, we, we need to, as Dr. Mason says, we need to become champions with the personal responsibility and voice that we have, speaking to what brings health to our community and still raising the awareness that, yes, Systematic racism, institutional racism, does exist, and they yes. do market those those communities that are very vulnerable. They make prey of them. It's called a capitalistic society. I want to I want to press that point about vulnerable populations and how conservative and el conservative elements in this nation would have you have you believe that people aren't necessarily picking themselves up by their own bootstraps. So let's talk about the vulnerable populations in the built environment. Uh, people that you necessarily may not see occupying public space. But one thing for sure, vulnerable populations, families, individuals, uh, they do have faith. And so you will find vulnerable populations, individuals, and families in a faith space more often than you do in public space. So I want to ask you, Pastor Hardy, about vulnerable populations. Do you feel like uh, you have the capacity to re-educate? Dr. Mason talked about the importance of educating. Re-educating people about the importance of of nutrition and physical activity in terms of having better health outcomes? Absolutely, and I see it as a dual role. Um, this is educating the dominant culture as well. First of all, the comment is, how come you guys can't get it together? First of all, every time we get it together, the dominant culture uses its persuasion to dismantle it for fear and intimidation that once you have broken the chains of, 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 of liberation and servitude that you're gonna become independent and you'll turn against us. So there's always that. And also with the, with the dominant culture, when they make statements like, we pulled ourselves up on our bootstraps, we came here. Well, what happens if you didn't have a boot? <laughs> so there was no straps to pull yourself up on. So you're still working at a disadvantage. Now, once you, if that being said, and we deal with that and tease that out, then you have the community that we serve. It is really taking responsibility for your own lifestyle. And it is using the media to actually turn on itself. What do I mean by that? Mm. If you take a look at certain uh, affluent, um, what you call uh, health food stores, they take a look at zip codes and they know the income in zip codes and they say, we're gonna put the higher end quality food in the neighborhoods where the income can really support the product. So those are not communities of color. So that means you have what you call food deserts where you go into communities of color and you won't find good, healthy foods being offered. Well, when you stop and think about it, the best, most natural food, since every, it's a, everybody desires healthy food but you can't afford it, a mother that's on Section 8 can still give her baby breast milk. It doesn't get much naturaler than mm. that. So you're offering a mother on Section 8 can actually give her baby what you can go buy at your five-star health food store if she breastfeeds. Wow. Then if she breastfeeds she's a, and, and, and avoids formula, then she's going to put in her body what is healthy for her baby. That's so that's attached to healthy eating. So without even getting into personal responsibility, and you know, you just if we do what's right, there's this that natural chain effect that gets back to the core of healthy eating, healthy lifestyle. You know what's so cool about that is is, is, is is more keeping with our traditional culture in that personal responsibility sounds okay, but I'm also personal responsibility for every responsible one around me, right? And that has to be retaught. I That's mean, good. I think uh, of how we may have grown up in our generation and all the people that weren't our parents who could jack us if we did something wrong. Do you know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm old school enough that I still jack kids when I see them. That's I don't right. know who, I, who they are, but... So I think the personal responsibility has a place, but I think also we're, we have a very uh, a, a bigger burden, is that I can only be 
uh, responsible for taking care of me, I have to make sure that I take care of people that live in my community and live with me. So not only do I try to stay healthy, but I would try to encourage my neighbor, my brother, my cousin to do the same thing. So I, I think we have a very special burden, and I agree with you, that there's a, a message for both dominant and non-dominant societies, but we're all in the same boat. That's right. right? And so uh, if I let your community starve or, or get ill, I will pay for it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I can pay for it now by educating you on the cheap, or I can pay for you when you become hospitalized and become very burdensome. So I think we all have a very special role. And like I said, when you see uh, churches and, and faith-based individuals stepping up, uh, I, I'm, I'm given hope. And, and, and let's hope we can make this much more contagious. So it, it feels like the three of us are in agreement that we're all broken until we're all fixed. That's right, good. Right. That's, a, that's an excellent way to say it. And then because we, we live in one of the greatest countries in, in the world, capitalistic, demo, democratic society, uh, the market is driven by the consumer. Now, when the consumers become aware and they want healthy food, then they start marketing to their audience. Absolutely. So if you notice the fast food stores are starting to advertise and promote healthy foods. And, and with the pressure that's been applied, you'll see certain uh, main food chains and food distributors are now starting to say, well, we're going to stop putting toys in. We're at least going to make you pay more to put toys in. It, some say they haven't gone far enough, but it's a nudge. It's a moving of the boulder. You start to see more salads on menus, and you start to see those type of things. Now, once they start doing that, then somebody starts to say, well, you know what? Let's get back to gardens. Because as we put in our yes. victory garden where I live in my own personal home, the activity was a family activity. Me and my daughter built the raised bed garden. My wife and son planted the seeds. Now we go to the backyard and pull out potatoes. We pull out squash. And then to watch nature, it puts us outdoors doing things yes. when we instead of sitting in playing PlayStation, Xbox. Come on. And the bit, whoa, I found a potato. Finding the potato is just as much fun and exciting for a child as having moved to the next level in, in an electronic game. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. We're, we're approaching a break. We've got about a couple of minutes left. So I want to go back to what you said about uh, access to healthy food and affordability of the food. Uh, Multnomah County recently launched a healthy retail initiative where they're creating relationships with store owners and asking the store owners, what do you need in your store to make your space a healthier space? So there necessarily might be an opportunity for people with limited incomes to actually get healthy foods in these corner stores. What are your thoughts on that in terms of how can we get the community to start supporting these smaller stores? You know, it's funny. If we had a community meeting now but on part of any governmental agency and just put out a, you know, a, a blurb that we're having a meeting, you would get certain people at the table and certain people wouldn't come. They historically don't come. So when you think about vulnerability, one of the things that, that I use as the marker is to what extent are they represented at the policy or decision-making apparatus, right? Mm -hmm. So part of what we have to do is while we're educating is also getting people who will work in hand with the Multnomah County or with the state of Oregon or with the federal government, who work in hand with a, 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 a church or faith-based institution that's doing these things. So we have an opportunity to create leadership in so many, so many places. And, 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 and let's not make the, the fast food uh, uh, places a pariah. This is a capitalistic society, and right. they will respond to the marketplace. And you're absolutely right. What we've seen is a large fast food outlets do salads, do fruit, do vegetables. We need to be a little bit more demanding. Mm -hmm. and, and the voice just can't be one person speaking up. That's but right. if several of us go in mass, you'll see, see, see reaction. One, one quick response. Thank you. One quick response from Dr. Hardy, going back to Atlanta Centers for Disease Control Prevention and talking to new emerging Achieve communities. And we'll talk about Achieve maybe in the next half hour. Uh, what was your number one message to the emerging communities? Uh, and during the Achieve, is, is that to, to really promote um, capacity building is to invite people to the table that's not traditionally there. And rather than asking them to come to the meeting, as Dr. Mason said, you have to actually go there. And you can start by um, utilizing their space to host your meetings. Mm -hmm. So when you go there, you now are, are making it convenient for the people to come to because I call it, I call it water cooler conversions, water cooler conversions. And what does that mean? They always talked about the water cooler conversations right. where people stand around and talk. Well, if you go to the place where people are, uh, 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 are attracted to to get water, if you take your message there, you can have conversions at the water cooler. So if you go to houses of faith, if you go to the library where people naturally congregate, if you go to those places uh, and then host your meetings, people begin, become curious about what's happening in their neighborhood, in their community, and then they start to attend. That's, those are one ways to, yeah. to bring those things. Yeah. So it's called you know, synergy. 
And then um, in doing that, taking the time to slow down, because oftentimes what happens is they come up with a plan, they have an idea, they start moving forward, they pull people together, they apply for the grants. Mm -hmm. Then they come out and they try to force people to adopt or receive it. But if they were to slow down once they get this and introduce it and ensure that questions are asked, solicit response, and, and, and avoid acronyms and the things exactly. and the jargon, and then be able to try and really show those people that their voices are included at the table. And that includes people who have a second language, communities of color, people who are not like them. And being able to listen because they, generally they will, they will always offer something that the, the, the main people didn't think of or don't agree with. But that's why they're supposed to be at the table. So you don't necessarily have to agree with their idea, but if they're willing to test some of the community members' ideas, you might find it'll work. Okay, uh, two phenomenal doctors there in the house. Uh, you're tuned into Oregon Voters Digest. We're gonna take a small break and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about economic, talk about economic development and maybe even a little bit more about health outcomes. Back in a second. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, we're in our second half hour of Oregon Voters Digest. I'm your guest host, Eugene Rashad, and Mr. Bruce Broussard will be back next Sunday, so don't worry, your regular viewers, he'll be back uh, in the chair. I have a, a, a table of dynamic people, and we just had a, an additional phenomenal man just join us, James Winters, who is a, a businessman. He's a, a financial wizard, uh, he's an entrepreneur, he's a, a, a film critic, a filmmaker, um, I don't know what else to call you, James. Just don't call you late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> about 
average golfer. How's that? Uh, he's a phenomenal golfer. Don't don't, don't believe me. Well, we, <laughs> welcome welcome to Oregon Voters Digest. Thank you. I want to I want to uh, finish our discussion about health a little bit because we didn't really unpack fully uh, Dr. Hardy's trip back to DC uh, back to Atlanta, Georgia. So can you give us a summary? of what the findings were, what the purpose of the trip was for our viewers, and then we'll go right into our uh, discussion on economics. Well, the findings are in, and the jury has returned. What it is is America is unhealthy. Uh, we're suffering in all of the misery indexes as a whole. It's no longer just racial, even though it's, there's disparities and inequities, but straight across the board, our youth are more susceptible to have diabetes. Many of them are at, will be developing stage two. Um, and moving on and advancing into it. They're sedentary lifestyles. Children don't play, they're not active, and the foods that they consume are unhealthy. Mm -hmm. This being said, they've empowered several different communities across America, several different states, who have received uh, capacity building grants. And that is to go out and do an assessment about things that need to be addressed in the community to do assessments, to take a look at uh, whether they have safe parks, whether they have roads, complete streets is what they call them, sidewalks, areas for the bicycles, pedestrians, along with cars and regular mass transit rail. Take a look at uh, spaces where people are at and make sure it's conducive for walking and for biking, uh, not just in communities, but traveling back and forth to work and things like that. So they were giving those communities the tools to do accurate assessments, knowing that part two, they would develop implementation, how they address those areas identified. I, I need to ask you this question on here on a local level. <laughs> Was the connection made with gentrification and economic development in the communities that we're, we're trying to uplift and move further upstream? What was uh, pleasantly surprising is 20% um, of the recipients were Native Americans. So out of Alaska, um, Arizona, Washington State, and various other parts of the country, it was Native American Indian tribes. So one of the panelists was <laughs> Chief Smith, who spoke. Wow. Um, then they had someone out of Cincinnati. They were European from the Y. But it was amazing to see that they were intentional in including the underserved populations. So it seems like this is a real initiative to really get America up on its feet yes. and back into a healthy lifestyle. Thank you, Hardy. I, Dr. Hardy, I want to uh, go to James uh, Winters now. Uh, James, I want to ask you, just if you will, for the benefit of our, our, our viewers, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to this seat. Well, I got to the seat you invited me, but um, in, in, a, uh, in the business world, I, I went to school, went to Benson High School, Graduate from Oregon State, worked at a number of uh, jobs. I think I got fired from everyone, and uh, I became self-employed after that. Uh, over the years, uh, myself and my business partner, Gregory Allen, company has owned Taco Bell franchises, Jet Fuel Distribution Company, um, uh, convenience stores, gas stations. Um, we made a decision back in 08 to sell uh, everything. And I think at that point, the, the, the uh, consensus was to step back a little bit from things and maybe get some, uh, some issues with our personal life straightened out. But now that that's passed, we want to come off the sidelines, put our uniform back on, mm -hmm. and get back out on the field and play. So towards that end, uh, we put together a private equity fund uh, to make middle market acquisitions, nothing that you see uh, these guys on Wall Street doing where you know, they throw away billions and billions of dollars on bad deals, but we're, we'll be well under the radar size-wise and, and target-wise as well. James, I want to talk to our, our panelists, you and the panelists as well, is about Occupy, but I want to ask you this question directly. Is green the new color? Um, well, he, here is the the <clears throat> issue about Occupy. I think it's a great movement, um, but there have been several great movements in this country, the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement stated their case. They said, this, we have discrimination. And they also stated a case for redress. They said, we want opportunities. We want jobs. We want access to facilities. We want this, that, and the other. We don't want segregated uh, a segregated country. The problem with Occupy is they stated the problem, which is 
1% of the country has a majority of the wealth, but they haven't said um, how that can be overcome. I have some of my own ideas, but some of the ideas I've heard informally are, are along the lines of reallocation of wealth, which I don't believe will ever happen. As African Americans, what we should be consumed with or concerned with is who gets the economic investment opportunity. Right now, it's not us. We're 20 something percent of the population. That's 20 percent of our money that's in pension funds, 20 percent of our money that's in life insurance annuities. That's what funds Wall Street, not these guys taking out a bank loan and rolling up their sleeves with, you know, in the guise of the American way. They're using our money to pad their own pockets from a transactional fee standpoint. Now, if we really want to change things or the Occupy movement really wants to change things, they need to stand up to who, who's fueling the Wall Street fire and say, you know what, I would tell you right now, if all the pension funds in this country stood up and said, all right, Wall Street, you don't get another dime, that place would be a ghost town. They wouldn't be able to do business. So we have, we do have some ammunition, and I don't think that they're, they're really articulating it in the right way, shape, or form that they should be. James, I, w I want to get our, our other panelists' uh, responses to that, but I want to ask you this other question about uh, Occupy and uh, the, the, uh, the protest against o Occupy as a nation. Um, so this economic model is not working. In fact, it's morphing into becoming something else. Is that a good sign? I don't think it's a good sign, and I agree that it is morphing into something else. And I've, I've heard uh, I'm, I'm more right-leaning than left-leaning politically and religiously, but uh, I've heard the arguments, and they're, they're, I think I heard Martin Luther King years ago said it, uh, it, it rings with piercing familiarity <laughs> in the ear of every Negro that these people are taking your money and making more money with it. But if you look at it, they actually haven't done in, in, in the big scheme of things, they don't make that much money with it. Uh, uh, most of the pension funds in this country have returned slightly above the U.S. Treasury, which is considered the safest return of all. The only thing that's happened is that you guys have $50, 60000000000 billion to manage. They get a 2% management fee and a 20% of any gain. I mean, that makes you a billionaire right there. So that's where we need to stand up and say the system is, is, is broken and we can't solve any of our own problems. I hate to, to go on shows and talk about money. It's very difficult for us to solve uh, some of the uh, issues that uh, uh, Pastor Hardy said and, and a lot of other issues that affect mainly African American uh, communities. They always expect us to solve it ourselves minus the money. Dr. Mason, it's clearly, in, in writing James's point, it's a short walk between wealth and, 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 uh, and being unhealthy. A short walk be between being, sitting, I'm sorry. Between wealth and being unhealthy. Um, I don't know, I, I think, you know, uh, what you were saying earlier, when you look at the inequities and things, like that, and, I, and I really agree with what he says, is I think that um, has to be a very, very, I, I think, a, a, a inclusive effort to make the changes. They also appreciate the idea around Occupy and the Civil Rights Movement. One was a little bit more outspoken and, 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 and transparent in what, what its goals were and what it's trying to do. And I think Occupy, I I'm, uh, don't know uh, everything I need to know about Occupy, but I don't see that happening yet. Mm. I would also say that it didn't start off being as, as, as inclusive as it could have, So, which goes back to the idea of how institutionalized bias kind of creeps in. But I do think we, we can become, uh, uh, as I hear him talk, and, and, I, uh, and his reputation precedes him, yes. is us being more financially literate. And I think that's a critical part. Um, if you think back to Dr. King, I think my take on Dr. King was he was really in trouble when he started to organize us economically because we can be a very, very powerful force. You also suggest that we're 20% of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, combined funds yet we're not 20% of the decision making around those funds mm -hmm. and we need to ask for our place at the table in that respect. So I think that uh, uh, when we look at these issues, um, I think there's enough talent in our community that could be mobilized. Um, I think those of us who have the microphone, who have the spotlight, need to bring others in who could be articulate and be informing. So I think that there's more resources out there. And then I think over the, uh, the past week, I think I heard of a, a, a candidate, one of the recent candidates talking about there aren't any role models in 
poor homes or black homes or something to that effect. I think there's a lot more resource there than we'd otherwise uh, otherwise think. Dr. Mason, I, I want I want to ask Dr. Hardy as you listen to this conversation evolve, and when you apply your lens to what uh, James Winters has said and Dr. Mason just articulated, what are you hearing? How are you experiencing well, uh, this? What What amazes me is the wealth of intelligence and the resources that the African Americans and Africans that are in America, what we really have, but the inability to rally around one single topic. Um, you, you seem to, a lot of times, it's the, the conversation is broached with um, black issues are democratic issues, black issues are poor issues, black issues are, are the extreme misery index type of topics. But when you take a look at the, the, the intelligence and the political power that's in the African American community, I wonder how come they can't come to the table put down their partisan type of issues and really say, what can we do to raise the African American and Africans that are in America up to a higher level? Why is it that we always allow our friends from another culture to come in mm. and tell us what we need to do for our people, but we can't come together and do it? So uh, I hear us say we need to be tough on crime. I hear that, and I hear people say, well, the personal accountability. But I, I think we all agree that we should have personal accountability, and I believe we all believe that we should be saving, and I think we all understand that single family housing and teen pregnancies, all of that, how it contributes to where we're at. Right. I get tired of us discussing the problem and not working on the solution. So I'm still waiting for African Americans to really sit down in one room, one auditorium, and really hash it out and leave the outsiders out and let us go ahead and handle our business. We can, you know, so that, that, that's what amazes me. So James, James Winters, from an economic standpoint, are we in queue to make that happen, to start looking at economic development, creating our own business, look, get into the spirit of entrepreneurial relationships? So what do you see? Well, that's what I've been told. I don't believe it. I don't. <clears throat> I think the um, uh, the the mindset that they have today is similar to a mindset that was probably viable 25 or 30 years ago. I think I, I saw something that said that 98 or 99 percent of all African American businesses are sole proprietorships. And having been in business for 20 plus years, and I, I can tell you that that that's really not going to put us in a position to solve anything. We need to have control over uh, employment. We need to pay taxes. It's very, very difficult to make a political case for what we're going through simply with voting power. We have to be able to say, okay, we're paying taxes on this. We want this to be different. But when most of us just have a sole <coughs> proprietorship and it's just us paying taxes, that would be different if there, we had 50, 75, 100 employees uh, paying taxes and generating that kind of wealth uh, I think we would have a, a, a much more attentive audience at the political top of things than we have right so now. So let me ask you then, how, how do we begin to mobilize that movement right here in this region? Well, I think I, I, I kind of want to follow up on what uh, Pastor Hardy was saying about, you know, uh, hashing things out. Maybe we, we should go and hash things out behind closed doors or even in this form. I mean, I've, I've, I've never been one to shy away from my perspective on business, and I know it's not shared in this community universally, and people want to do things the way they want to do things and the way it's being done. My perspective is, from my business experiences, that is a, a, a failed thesis going forward. We, we cannot continue to say, okay, um, uh, uh, powers to be, let's we're going to give you a community uh, business development grant on each player each applicant gets $5,000, and then they go out of business in three months, exactly. and they say, well, we gave you the money. That's not money. You think yeah, you go out to Southeast Portland and give somebody $5,000? They're not going to accept it. They're going to like, hey, that's not going to do anything for me. Well, James, shouldn't hobbies work as a, a, a successful and effective business plan? Uh, a hobby could, but uh, a hobby is, is really geared towards your passion for, for what you would do without compensation. Your business is what you put food on the table, pay rent, pay your mortgage with. And right now, uh, this state and all 50 states, to me, we're entirely underrepresented. And it's the basis of that is because we do not have access to our own capital, our own capital, our own money. Black folks, black firefighters, policemen, municipal workers, have their money in those pension funds. And these pension funds do not dole it 
out for us to take custody of and invest. We'll invest in our own community if you let us have it. It's ours. It's not like we're asking for any anything that we're not entitled to. What's the strategy? Can, can yes. I jump in? I mean, if you take a look at like the dominant culture, if you look at the support systems that they have in place, let's talk about like 4-H, let's talk about the YMCA, the YWCA, let's talk about um, the different community organizations, the Boy, the boy Scouts, yeah. the Girl Scouts, and you can just name them all. They never turn around and say, wait a minute, we gave the Boy Scouts money, all the rest of you, we don't need you. Or we gave, you know, the YMCA money, the rest of you, we don't need you. And if you have a learning curve, they're more forgiving because they understand that there's a learning curve for that organization to come up and, and they may have a crooked person running the organization. They'll, they'll judge that, that person, pull them out, and still fund that organization. You take an African-American group, they will fund the dominant culture. One group, as, as, as Brother Winters is saying, and then you, you go to apply for the grant and they'll tell you we've already funded that one over there. Mm -hmm. And if that one over there has a bad apple in it, they'll crush the whole organization and say, oh, that whole organization is no good because, look, they didn't handle their money right. They won't say they had a bad bookkeeper, get him out and keep it running. So they, we, I'll say we, communities of colors, the foreign uh, entities at the table get judged by a different criteria. They operate by a different standard, and they're looking for a one-shot cures all. Well, that, can that be called racism? Well, it could be intentional or it could be blind spots. I think we may do the same on our end, too, because sometimes we make the assumption that all wealthy people, want that 1%, want to get away with everything. But Warren Buffett got up and said, out of all the money I paid, I think I paid too little taxes. Did Warren Buffett, was that all his money? No, of course no. not. He, 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 he sold stock. He's still a Berkshire Hathaway as a publicly traded company. Their stock is owned by pension funds, mutual funds, uh, insurance annuities, all, all of which African Americans have a lot of money. And it's not he did not make he made a percentage of, of his wealth off of the total investment, which is the total investment for that company is substantial. So that's why he he's a billionaire. Now Warren Buffett has done very well. I regard him as a very sharp uh, businessman, but he wouldn't he didn't do it with his own money. And that's, that is the issue. And not only that, the people that aren't at Warren Buffett's issue, at, at his level, I, I, a lot of what they've done, what they've accomplished is overrated. I think I, think I told you uh, when we were playing golf that uh, CNBC had a, a monkey uh, pick a, a ping pong ball with stocks, just reach in there and grab them and throw them on the floor. And the returns for those stocks were either at or better than all the experts. <laughs> and he's working for peanuts. <laughs> he's not getting two, two and 20. He's working for peanuts. So the, the argument about we don't have the experience, we don't have the know-how, we don't have the, mm -hmm. all that goes out the window. And anyway, the bottom line is it's our money and we should be entitled to it. That's good. You know, it's interesting though, in, 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 in thinking about, we have to realize that we're not a monolithic group either, right? That we're very, very diverse. And I think that, um, Something that is, is interesting, you alluded to caucusing, that we need to come together, come to a room and hash it out. You know, some of the strange uh, tools that may work might be something like leisure hour, for example. Right? I know you golf. Mm -hmm. You golf. I, I almost golf. He golfs. You golf. Um, I think the way that you start is you come together around things that you have in common. Our differences mm -hmm. are apparent and they'll become, and they could divide us. But I think we have to come to, uh, um, like you're talking about, we, we focus on the problem and not solution. I think we do need to come together and rally around things that we do have in common. And if golf can bring us together as a vehicle, I, I, if faith can bring us together as a vehicle, and I mean that in an ecumenical yes, way. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's where, where we have to start. I also, I, I can't say it enough, is if you turn the clock back 30, 40 years, when the money, we were much more segregated in many ways, and money stayed in the community longer, we were, we were more powerful in many ways. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, yes. so, and so the strange thing is that we got told that the, the, the other guy's ice is colder, and so we, we lost sight of that. So I think, again, uh, financial literacy is a very big part of us. And you, you allude to uh, the, 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 the funds and what have you. I would say that there's a very small percentage of the African-American community is even aware of that. 
Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and, and that has to be more public public knowledge. And so, again, we have uh, uh, figures like this in our community as leaders, uh, homegrown and, and the whole bit. We have to find ways to get him to the forefront and educate a whole lot. More you just us. brought me to that question. We got about three minutes left in the program. So, what are our strategic steps from this point? Well, um, I, I'm a, I'm going to be uh, the first one to say I think we have a lot of organizations. Too many. We have a lot of meetings too many and my experiences with a lot of the things is that things never change uh if, if 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 we're going to make a defining moment we should just come together once and say this is what we're going to do and everybody has to stand behind that idea we can't go out of such a caucus or a meeting and everybody start fragmenting back to where they were before they stepped in the room if we want to change things i mean i've i've been on point with how to change things for the last five years I haven't really gotten much follow-up or any support from a lot of the the, the brothers and sisters in the community because they don't understand it I'm more than happy to, ex to explain it to them but I think that's that's the reason why it hasn't gained much traction let's try let's try this um, let's let's switch the conversation very quickly but it's really not a switch because we're all golfers here uh, James uh, the leisure hours got uh, a golf tournament it's a fundraising event coming up on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about it? Oh, well, I believe that's the annual, they have an annual New Year's Eve party. The Leisure Hour, uh, founded by uh, my family, is a, a, a golf organization that was founded to overcome segregation. Now it's multiracial, multicultural, and they, they strongly support juniors in golf. Golf is important for business, too. Uh, and I, I say in my newsletter about all the business contacts and the the, the Hollywood stars or whatever I've, I've gotten to associate with, you know, just because I, I play golf. And so I, I think that uh, people should pay special attention to what the Leisure Hour has to offer and uh, how they are uh, handling their charitable giving in this instance. And you did a documentary on, on Leisure Hours. So yes, um, I did. Well, look, this has been a fast half hour, certainly a fast hour. I want to thank all my guests for coming and contributing. This is just the beginning, hopefully, of a a fruitful discussion and creating some economic development and better health outcomes for our community. So we want to thank our, our, our guests and thank you, the viewer. I'm Eugene Rashad, and next week, Bruce Broussard will be back. Oregon Voters Digest. Have a fruitful holiday season.